So if there's anything that you'd like to revisit the session, you'll be able to get a recording of this. Um, at the same time, I will also be sharing today's presentation and, and workshop with you so you can review it subsequently. So in today's session will be on Scopus author profiling um, itself. My name is Nicholas, for those of you who may not know, and I'm the platform consultant from Elsevier. I'm based in Singapore, and what I do do is to work very closely on Science Direct journals and books together with Scopus itself, and I spend a lot of time working with analytics. So today's session will be a quick update for you on what is new with Scopus. Um, I'll be sharing with you some information about how Scopus indexes journals. And because I'm very aware that um, there's been talk of predatory publishing, so I'll be sharing with you on some key th concerns um, and how Scopus has avoided that. The next session will be on how Scopus author profiles actually work, how author profiles can showcase research, how you can collaborate internationally and locally within Malaysia, and how you can create an ORCID ID. Um, later on in the session itself, when we have time, I can easily run through with you a live demonstration, and then we can spend time taking questions and answers. So if there's any pressing question, feel free to type them in the question and answer chat box that you see on top of you or below you, depending on how you dock your Zoom profile. So just type in your chat box and I'll answer your questions subsequently. Okay, so what is new with Scopus? Um, you probably see this very often whenever you join Scopus workshops, but this one is probably our most updated content slide as of the moment. Um, we work together with 7,000 over publishers. We have indexed over 25,751 serial titles. And as of the moment, we have over 82 million items on Scopus. This is very substantial. Um, we are the world's largest abstract and indexing database. And through this process of big data collection, we have accrued a total of 17 million author profiles and over 80,000 affiliation profiles um, globally. So we really place a very strong discovery and analytics tool in terms of researchers, librarians, research managers, all in your hands. And most of you are aware you're probably able to leverage on Scopus to identify which journals to submit to. But crucially in today's session, we want to emphasize how you can track and assess a researcher's impact. We want to allow you to decide whom from where that you can collaborate with. We want you to showcase to you trending global research trends, to find current research and to differentiate yourself to publish better than ever before. So this is our latest March Scopus coverage. Um, we, I get a lot of questions usually from USM, like which journals are currently updated, if they are missing citations. And this is something that we do um, very actively. We index approximately about 10,000 articles every single day um, from over 25,000 journals. And we can see in this case how the breakdown of content is like. So within a global perspective, we work together with QS University Rankings and Times Higher Education World University Rankings. Um, from an Asia-Pac perspective, we work together with Thailand Citation Index over in Thailand, the National Research Fund in Korea. We work together with Beijing University, Keio University, and closer to shore, uh, Nanyang Technological University in Singapore. How we actually aggregate all this content is because we work together with the data in our content repository. Um, Scopus delivers all the meta, uh, metadata provisioned by the publishers, which includes the author profile, the affiliation profile, the document titles, um, the electronic identification, as well as the citation counts. And this is how we generate the content that we are able to share. So you're probably aware that you can use scopus.com, right, to just get the data you're looking for. But there are times when people will be asking us for more um, specific content about research itself, right? Sometimes people want to know, they want to do a very specific data heavy um, perspective. And what you can do is to use the Scopus API. If you feel that you're doing a research which requires Scopus API, feel free to reach out to myself and I'll be very happy to assist you on this. 
Um, custom data is essentially the bulk delivery of data in static form. And this is what we provision for QS University rankings, as well as Times Higher Education. So one thing which we want to share, showcase to you is that we have a very strong historical depth of content, which allows you to have a much more uh, comprehensive view in terms of the author profiles. Um, this will also improve the H index measures for authors who have published prior to 1996. So you have a much more holistic view of authorship. And a very key component that people have been asking us is that because of the Springer, the Scientometrics article published, um, one thing which we always want to emphasize is that Scopus always looks to maintain high quality content. So there's a very strong rigorous re-evaluation process and criteria. Um, so one thing that you should be aware of is less than half the reviewed titles are selected for Scopus coverage. Um, we have a content selection advisory board comprising of top quality journal editors and they have a very strict selection criteria that I'll showcase to you. So this is a content selection and advisory board. They are all journal editors chosen for their expertise in specific subject areas. And for your knowledge, all titles on Scopus um, go through two rounds of uh, selection. The first round will be titles they all need to meet this minimum criteria to be considered for review, which is the peer review, the abstract needs to be written in English. It needs to be published regularly. You need to have a Roman script references as well as a publication ethics statement, right? These are the five steps. And this is what we call a title suggestion. Um, it's only after the title suggestion is over that the titles are then reviewed by the CSAB team according to this 14 criteria in terms of journal policy, um, content quality, journal reputation, um, publication regularity, as well as online availability. I'll go through all this, um, all this in a subsequent session, um, in the next session in May that we are talking about, but I thought you should be aware of this on what actually goes on in the meantime. So what we want to do is that Scopus is committed to creating a representative data set of scholarly content as well as author profile. And um, the journal selection is based on the journal level data and performance, and we monitor and deselect titles which are predatory or below standards. So I understand that most of you, sometimes when you publish an article on a journal index in Scopus, you might find that the journal is no longer indexed in Scopus. Um, I'm very cognizant that this is an issue. And what we have done is that we want to update our title list on a monthly basis so that you be kept up to date on which titles are still indexed within Scopus and which are not. But the key thing that we need to share with you is that Scopus cannot interfere with the editorial autonomy of journals, right? So um, the quality of individual articles and conferences is an editorial decision based on the editors of the journal. This is something we cannot intervene. Um, we cannot decide what is the content of the articles and abstracts to be included in the database. We, are not, we cannot be responsible for the plagiarism and other publication malpractice of these articles and we are not responsible for the authorship of the paper. All this actually falls under the editorial perspective um, in terms of the journal management. So where Scobus comes in is that we work together with the publishers of the journal and not the editors. And we really want to talk about what is the definition of predatory journals. Um, because people are not, it's a bit very gray area. So a very important part that and a statement that we have come to define is that predatory journals and publishers are entities that prioritize self-interest at the expense of scholarship, and they are characterized by false or misleading information, the deviation from best editorial and publication practices, a lack of transparency, and the use of aggressive and indiscriminate solicitation practices. So when you're looking for a journal to publish in, you need to ask yourself this question. Um, does it seem like the journal doesn't have high standards? Uh, does it seem like the editor and publication practice is not clear? Um, is there a lack of transparency? Um, did they actively ask me very aggressively to publish my articles with them while promising like a peer review period of one week? You know, So you need to understand that predatory journals are entities that prioritize self-interest at the expense of scholarship. So one thing that Scopus has done is that we have been identifying poor quality journals with a lower than average performance. Um, but one thing you need to understand is that sometimes they may have a low performance, but they could 
have content that's relevant to be included in Scopus, right? So this includes niche journals, which includes which covers research published that could be of high quality in the future. And these journals might not necessarily be needed to be removed from Scopus. This is one thing that you need to be aware of. Um, but one thing which we take very seriously is predatory journals. Um, and one thing that we also point out is that journals included in Scopus, they benefit from wider global visibility to with the in increase of impact and quality. But sometimes this doesn't always happen and the journal may become predatory when they change their editorial board, right? This is something out of our control. Um, one thing you need to notice is that when you make deci decisions about research, um, these are based on data that you can trust, right? And the other gray area is that because predatory publishing is ill-defined and subject to personal interpretation, uh, independent review of individual journals by academic subject experts is very important. So if you feel that there's an area you're not so sure about, maybe check with your peers or your colleagues who are subject matter experts and you can identify these journals better. But the one thing that I think is crucial to showcase to you is um, what goes on when you're choosing a journal for coverage in Scopus. Uh, what happens is the title suggestion phase comes from the publisher or the editor in chief. Um, they have to complete a title suggestion form. And then that's when Scopus does the minimum criteria check. Um, if the quality is not good enough, then it's rejected. And then you're an embargo for five years, right? The reason why the embargo criteria is so strict and sometimes people might say a bit harsh, it's very simple. It's because um, we don't want journals to come in at our doors every single year when you're not ready. We want to make sure that the Scopus, the, the journals are ready, you're ready to be published and indexed on Scopus before you submit over to us. But needless to say, whenever the criteria is met, we will always provide you with an enrichment form so that you know what you can do to make the journal title better, right? It's only after the title is enriched before it's being released to the CSAB for review, the subject chair will review it and then we'll give feedback on which it's, uh, it's to be included on Scopus or otherwise. So we also do a constant re-evaluation to make sure that the journal itself is of high quality. So this comes from feedback from the community when we identify journals using metrics and benchmark and we use a radar technology. So I'll, go, I'll cover this subsequent, um, in more detail in the next session itself, but I thought it'd be interesting to showcase to you. Um, we always take approximately about two years. Um, we will give the journal heads up when the journal is underperforming based on uh, metrics. If you underperform for two consecutive years, then the title will be reevaluated. And this is really how it's like, right? It's a constant monitoring, flagging, as well as curation. I thought it would be interesting to showcase to you this data. Um, one thing that we've had, we did was to reevaluate about 990 titles, almost a thousand titles in 2016 to 2020. Um, of the 44% that had publication concerns, um, 289 were discontinued, right? Of the 33 that were underperforming, about 165 were discontinued. So this is something that we take actually very seriously. And we thought you should know that when we um, reevaluate the journal content and the data itself, this goes through a very um, tedious, arduous process. Okay, so, but here's where you're actually here for, right? Now that I've talked to you about the background on Scopus, how we constantly curate the content and the data, you probably want to know how the author profiles on Scopus actually work. Okay, so it's actually quite straightforward. Um, it, remember I was talking to you about the sheer volume of data that goes through Scopus? Um, with this, we are we're actually able to implement an uh, algorithmic and systematic author disambiguation um, dis process with high accuracy to create and to maintain a very precise and complete profiles. Um, the other thing that we can do, we have implemented recently, will be an author feedback wizard. So some of the comments and feedback that we have consolidated, um, they showcase and they share that the use of Scopus has boosted their research activities because they can find information and authors in their research area, and they are also kept up to date about work being done in research areas. So this is how it's really like, right? The 82 million records, the affiliation profiles, and the author profiles. So 
By using a data processing method, we are able to group papers to an individual's profile with a high degree of accuracy based on the name, the email, the affiliation, the subject areas, the citations, and the co-authors. This is actually what goes on in the background, right? So when you submit, when a paper is being published, well, when you publish a paper with a journal that is indexed on Scopus, the publisher would submit an abstract and citation record of this over to us. So from this, we'll be able to accrue the data and then we are able to generate the profile. The other thing that we have done is to include a feedback wizard um, so that you can change and edit it. And this happens because sometimes there might be names that are common, there are names that may be changes, there might be incomplete metadata, right? All these errors definitely happen and um, we want to make life easier for you to manage it. But let me go through this in more uh, granular detail and a step-by-step -step guide so that you're aware of it. Okay, how can author profiles showcase research? It's quite straightforward. Um, at the end of the day, you're probably aware of um, which research area of interest uh, you're interested in, right? And this is when you should add it over to the document search. So if you're looking for say um, COVID-19, and then you're looking for, say, uh, Professor Fauci, right? Because he's very famous right now in COVID-19 uh, areas of research. So in the main first page that you go on to Scopus, you can look for the keywords under article title, abstract and keywords, and then you look for the author name here. The other thing that you can do is that if you are familiar with the author that you want to work with, um, look for the author's name specifically. In this case, it's Fauci A. The other thing you could do is that if you have saved all this author's name and then you have their ORCID ID, then you can look for their ORCID ID specifically. Then some of you will be asking about what exactly is ORCID and I'll cover this in the later part of the session. But the other part which I do like is that sometimes you want to look for authors by an institution. So what I do is that I'll go to the Scopus affiliation search. I'll search for say USM, right? And then the other thing that we can point out, I'll point out is that every, every affiliation and every author profile, they have their own Scopus unique ID here. So in, this is what we call the affiliation ID. And this is the case for USM. Over here, we can see like you have over 14,000 authors, right? 14,038. We can see what the breakdown is like. And then you can see who the top author are. In this case, um, Professor Fun with over 2,600 documents with a H index of 56. Professor Ismail with um, 765 documents with a H index of 54. Um, Professor Zanraya with um, 672 documents with a H index of 36. You can filter all this by say subject area, by affiliation, et cetera. So this would help make your life easier. We go into this subsequently during the live session. So the first one example that I came across was Professor Fauci. Professor Fauci was from the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases. Um, when you click on the author information, you'll be able to see his breakdown, right? Um, based on where he was working at, what he has published, et cetera, the years and institution of affiliations. This is quite useful, right? And then we can see in this case, this is a Scopus ID. Professor Fauci does not have an ORCID ID. So maybe this is something that he may want to do in the future. But one thing you can see is that you can take a look at edit the profile, you can set alert, set alert, and you can save it to list. But then now look at his metrics. We can see that Professor Fauci has published about 1,174 documents. Um, he has approximately almost 120,000 citations with a H index of 178. This is substantial, correct? No, the next step that I want to bring you forward to you for your attention is that um, when you look at all this information, you want to know what does this tell you, right? So the next step I'll point out is take a look at the document and citation trends. We can see um, which year he's active in, when are the years that he's published the most articles in. Then the other new thought thing that I am quite excited about is what we call topics. So we can see that the most contributed topics was in 2015 to 2019. Your first question is, why is it 2015 to 2019 and not 2016 to 2020? Very valid question. Um, it's because actually 
Scopus data takes approximately about five years, well, about July, June to July of the current, the next year to consolidate. So if you want to look from 2016 to 2020, it will be approximately May, June, July of 2021. Then you can see the most contributed topics because it's consolidated. Then the next thing you can see is what are the topics that uh, Professor Fauci has written, right? In this case, it's antibodies in the HIV vaccine, uh, a simian immunodeficiency virus, and an Ebola hemorrhage uh, fever, right? That's just some of the areas that um, Professor Fauci was an expert in. The other thing that we can see over here is that these are the documents, the preprints, and the co-authors, so you can go into more detail. So. The other example that I would like to showcase is Professor Zainraya from uh, USM. We can see that Prof uh, Zainraya has an ORCID ID, right? And then this is actually quite useful. We can see that she has um, published about 672 documents with a H index of 36, started publishing and was very, very active uh, during this particular period in time. And I think what, was, what is interesting is that um, her area of specialization will be in terms of ion sensitive fuel effect transistors, um, pH sensors and gates, uh, photo detectors in terms of ultraviolet detectors and responsivity, um, a gallium nitrides and nanowires. And we can see in this case how the publication and the topics are like. Okay, so now that this has come across, well, okay, I want to do one more. Um, area of topic before we go on to the next section, before I actually make this like a live demo. And then people on the chat can type in examples of authors that they would like to look for or areas of topics they would like to work on, right? I think this will be much more engaging and dynamic. So the other thing is that if you feel that there are any errors in your profile, and I'll be the first to admit that Scopus is not 100% perfect, there is always going to be a couple of errors here and there. In this case, you can always click on edit profile. So when you edit the profile, you'll be able to do a couple of things. One, you can set your preferred name. Two, you can manage, merge your profiles. Three, you can add and remove documents. And four, you can update your affiliation. Then when you're certain, then you can click on proceed to make changes. And then you can ask yourself, is there a name preference that um, I want to change and adapt accordingly? And then um, at the end of the day, they will go through with you a whole list of other questions. Now that you selected your profile, then you can review the documents. So if you have over 1,200 documents, maybe it's actually a bit hard to go through all of them. But at the end of the day, we really want you to start doing this um, from scratch. And then it would give you a very good, clean uh, representation of your own uh, profile. So if you feel that the document's missing, you can always click on search missing documents over here, right? You can search for a missing document, type it in with the um, article title and abstract, and then search for it. And then the last part would be that you can review the affiliation for yourself. And then in this case, it will be USM, and then you can confirm and submit. The next step that I would go on and I want to, and people tend to ask me this is, what exactly is a H index? And I think that's a very, very uh, good and valid question. So the H index is basically a standardized metric in which the number of published papers um, and the number of times that the author is cited is put into relation, right? It's essentially like a median count. So the formula is based on the number of papers that have been cited compared to those that have not been cited nor cited as much. And the main reason for this calculation is quite straightforward because we don't want people to just publish one paper with a lot of citations and then they stop publishing. We don't want people to publish a lot of papers, but they don't have good citations. So we want to find what's a good soft spot, right, in terms of the overall representation of the person's research career. So in this case, Professor Fauci has published approximately about, has a H-index score of 178, because he has 178 publications that are cited at least 178 times. If you notice it, it's not a score of 179 because that citation on his 179th title is only 176, right? So he has to be equivalent at least 178 times. So yeah, and we can see in this case, 177 title, he has about 178 citations, but this is really the, the exact spot. So 
the remaining articles or those that have not reached 178 citations, they are put away. So this is something we, we want to showcase to you. Okay, so now that we have come to this point, um, let's give a quick question and answer session on any queries that you have. Yeah, um, the recorded session will be made available for everyone. So not to worry, Shangshu. Okay, so Abdullahi is asking as a postgraduate student of the institution, how are we able to access the bibliometric data for bibliometric analysis when outside the campus? So before I carry on, I think Inchek Kamal is actually available here. So Inchek Kamal, um, let me actually make you a presenter so that you can share this information with everyone on how you can actually access it. So let me allow you to talk. Yes, Nick. Uh, can, can you repeat again? What do I need to do now? Sorry, someone wants to know how can they access um, Scopus from outside the campus? Oh, Scopus. Okay, actually, uh, it is the, the similar to any other databases that library subscribe. As usual, you need to go to the library website. So I think all of us are familiar with library website, lib.usn.my. Then you can click to off-campus login via open attendance. Then you need to log in using your official USM email and the password of that email. After that, they're going to list down all the databases that we do have, including Scopus. Then you just uh, choose Scopus from the list. Then you can browse Scopus as usual. So that's all. Thanks, Inche Kamal. So, uh when you do all these stages, this is where you'll be able to actually um, access Scopus itself. So I'm sharing my screen right now. Let me know if you can see it. And um, this is how you can actually um, start browsing through Scopus. You can go through the author profile itself, right? So remember just now we we're talking about Fauci, Professor Fauci. So Fauci and A, you can start searching for it. And then in this case, you'll be able to see how Professor Fauci is like. So this is Professor Fauci's overall Scopus profile. You can come over here. When I click on all this, and this will take some time to load because Professor Fauci has had a long history in terms of publishing. You can see this is like literally his entire body of work, right? And where he has worked at, it's actually very comprehensive, um, very, very long list. Then the next thing you'll probably observe is that these are the subject areas that Professor Fauci is working in. And you can see that he specializes in medicine and immunology, right? Pretty useful stuff. Now, you can take a look over here and then you can see all the metrics that I was talking about. So the one thing that I'd like to take a look at would be to take a look at say, um, what is this most cited work, right? When you click over here, you can see the newest piece of research or the highest citations. Um, both have their own advantages. When you're citing it by your highest, you can see what's the latest, um, what was the most prominent work that he had worked on, right? But when you're looking for, say, sorting by the latest date itself, you are actually able to see um, what is the current work that he is working on. So needless to say, <laughs> Prof. Fauci has been working a lot on COVID-19. Um, so you can see like SARS-CoV-2 viral variants, how do you tackle a moving target, what are the variants of concern in the United States, research in the context of a pandemic, um, yeah, and COVID-19 conversation with Professor Fauci. All this information, I think they are actually pretty useful that you may want to tune in and take a look at to see what he is working on. Then we can take a look at the co-authors and you can see who is the author that he's worked with the most often as well, right? This might be a strong point for collaboration that you can be considered. But topics is something that I am very passionate about because I think this gives you a very good idea of what is trending topics. And it gives you a good idea on whom you can want to collaborate and work with. I will cover this session, needless to say, I'll be covering this session later on, but I thought this is something that you might be interested in too, right? So let me go take a look at a much more specific example closer to home when I'm looking for USM itself. So when I'm looking for USM, right, what I can do is University Science Malaysia, right? Um, I can start browsing for, for authors by browsing for, say, under this author group itself. So USM is very strong, right, in terms of um, 
health sciences, engineering, for instance. So let's take a look at Professor Zainuraya because that's the one that our example that I used just now. Um, we can go into this and then we can click on show all the author information. So Professor Zainuraya has been, had a very, very comprehensive list of uh, research as well. Probably studied in Ohio University in Athens, um, United States. Um, you can see in this case, very strong background in nano opto electronics research and technology. And you can see how this has leveraged on, right? And then um, she was at the Institute of uh, Nano Opto Electronics Research and Technology, you know, in Penang in USM. Then we can see in this case, uh, nothing surprising, right? Because you can see the publication and documents um, is here. We can see the H index is high at 36. And we can see in this case, the most contributed topics in this case would be from 2015 to 2019 on ion sensitive field effect transistors on photo detectors, gallium nitrides, zinc oxides. And we can see in terms of photo detectors, ultraviolet detectors and responsivity, she has a very high field weighted citation impact of 1.33. For those of you who might not know what an FWCI is, um, it's really a normalized mean where one is the global average and things higher than one showcases um, that she's, her body of work is 33% higher than the global average. We can see also in this case of the research areas of vanadium uh, pentoxide in terms of lithium ion batteries and nano ribbons, she has a few weighted citation impact of 1.2, which is great. Then we can go to the the most latest um, documents, right? And in which she has been working on. And then we can see that the most recent publication uh, is in the effects of a post um, deposition annealing temperature in nitrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen ambience on polycrystalline gallium oxide films, for instance. And then if you want to, you can cite it by the highest total number of citations. And then this will give it some time to run, right? But we can see that um, a work that she has worked on in terms of growth kinetics, physical properties, and emission mechanisms has gotten her about 181 citations. So this is some ways that you might be interested in. And then again, if your area of research and interest is in terms of um, nano optoelectronics, these are some of the people that you can consider taking a look at, and these are her strongest collaborators, right? Um, yeah. I thought it would be interesting to showcase to you when you're looking for it. So let's make this more dynamic, right? Um, I want you to give yourself maybe about a quick seven minutes here. Seven minutes, maybe you can type in the chat box some of the authors that you'd like me to demonstrate or maybe some authors that you'd like to take a look yourself, right? But I think it'd be more fun if you give me an author that you're probably following and then I can just run a search and then you guys can confirm with my overall analysis. So please feel free to type in the chat box or the Q&A box. Any examples that you'd like me to search for? Okay, I have one, Professor Asman Shamsuddin. Okay, you have to give me a while huh? because <laughs> I need to do the search. Ah, how do you follow an author? That's a good question. I will get to that in a bit. I believe, is this the Professor Samsudin that you're referring to? Probably not, right? So sometimes, which is why sometimes when it comes to the ID itself, it's actually more accurate if you can give me an ORCID ID itself. So um, this is actually quite useful too. Ah, okay. Sorry, okay, if you give me a bit, uh, I'm gonna go through some of the examples in the fastest possible time that I can.
Okay, we have a professor, Tay Sin In. Um, she has published probably about 41 documents over at USM. Um, pretty cool stuff. Uh, most contributed topics were in terms of control charts, in terms of marketing and quality management practices. Um, one of which is a monitoring process mean and variability with an EM, EWMA chart, right? So in terms of like the author information, um, Professor Tay is strong in terms of engineering, mathematics, computer science, right? Decision sciences. So very analytical stuff. We can see in this case, like Professor Tay's um, most highly cited work was in 2010, 2017. Uh, they includes as well a run sum control charts for monitoring of the coefficient in terms of variance. Then when we go into say at the topics itself, we can see in this case, when it comes to cost related marketing and corporate social performances and corporate philanthropy, um, there's a FWCI of 1.49, really good, right? In this case, when there's art uh, topics on failure modes and effects analysis in terms of risk rank, it's a FWCI of 1.57, 57% higher than the global average. Um, that's actually pretty interesting as well. Okay, I would need to go on in a bit. Okay, let me try this one. Professor Kunio Ishikawa sounds familiar, actually. I have to take a look at this. So, but you, you, get, you guys get what I'm trying to do here because I think it's actually quite fun when you're able to key in your own um, lecturers, your own professors that you're familiar with, and then you can see how well they're performing. So in this case, uh, Professor Ishikawa from Kyushu, um, pretty impressive FWCI, or, uh, sorry, H index of 41. Um, Professor Ishikawa has published approximately 328 um, documents. And when we look into more um, into detail, we are able to see that Professor Ishikawa is in the areas of material science, engineering, chemical engineering, areas in which USM is of course very, very, very strong in. Um, when I take a look at the topics, or let's see the top highest um, cited article, right? It's a zinc releasing calcium phosphate for the simulation of bone formation. This is a very highly cited work. We can see in this case, um, an estimation of mechanical strength and critical porosity of calcium phosphate cement as well, right? And then we can see a formation of hydroxy um, petite in new calcium phosphate cements. So we can see in this case, he's very, very strong in this case of bone cements and bone substitutions. And these are some of the areas of research that he's probably published a lot of work in, right? So these are some areas of research which I think might be interesting for you to note. Um, you can see some of the co-authors that he has worked with very often, including a Professor Kanji, Professor Shigeki, Kazumi, etc. So maybe this area of research is something that you're interested in too. Okay, let me go back to the chat. Yes, Professor Manjet Kao, Professor Singh, sorry, let me get back to you. I think in this case, in this case, um, when it comes, it's a good question, uh, Professor Singh. So in this case, it depends on the publications. Let me take a look at a quick question at um, how the name come, the name profile comes across, and then I can take a better look for you. So Professor Singh, you have probably about 38 documents over here. Let me know if this is right. Perfect, okay. So clearly your strength is in social sciences, arts and humanities, business management and accounting. Um, you have probably published about 38 documents indexed on Scopus with a H index of nine, which is pretty good. Um, because at the end of the day, the H index is essentially just the, um, the count is a raw score, but it's not normalized based on subject category. That's a very key thing that I would like to point out. So you have actually done some research on Kahoot, which is a gamification in higher education. Kahoot is pretty cool. I've used it myself as well, and I think it's quite useful too. Um, you have done a, a very highly cited work in terms of graduate students' academic writing practices in Malaysia, challenges and solutions. And I'm sure that this is, of course, a real problem that everyone's facing too. So this has, cited, this has been cited 22 times. Then this is probably sorted by the highest work. And then I can see what your newest work is. 
So it's actually really good when someone is the live participant here and I can ask you questions and you can tell me if my, my conclusion is correct or otherwise. So your latest area of research will be in terms of communication apprehension amongst Japanese international students in a language immersion program in Malaysia and language ideology of an English medium instruction in higher education, right? So these are very unique topics, I would say, and very something that you obviously specialize in. Um, when I take a look at, say, language socialization um, and communicative language teaching, I can see that you're getting very, very high FWCIs um, in these areas of research that you're talking about. We can see in this case of a topic with few weighted citation impact is 1.29 for language socialization, a 2.63, really good um, in terms of communicative language teaching. Um, international students um, will be 1.08 and in terms of mobile learning language development is 1.12. So these are actually pretty interesting things that, um, yeah, I can see that you have been specializing in as well. Okay, I will have to get back. Okay, one second. Are all documents, so I think I need to help you with merging of documents as well, right? So actually, um, Professor Singh, what I can do, right, is that I can take, a, I can communicate with you offline. You have my email and um, you can reach out to me, n.park at elsevier.com, and I can run through a session with you on how we can um, edit your profile. But maybe what you can do is that maybe I can take a look here and then I can start like doing an edit profile as example, right, like how we can do it. So what I can do is edit profile, proceed to make changes. I'm not going to change anything right now, just so you know. So you have different um, profile names that you can consider changing or setting. I am not going to change anything at the moment uh, because I want to know what your specific preferences are. But you could possibly go on to this, right, and then continue on with this. Um, well, I'm submitting it on your behalf, of course. And then now we can take a look and you can review all the publications that um, we have observed. So if there are any documents missing, then I can search for missing documents over here. And then we will have to search for the title, abstract, and keywords here based accordingly. Okay, so I have to go back and go to Kmanjet, my bad. <laughs> so yes, but you kind of get the idea of what we're trying to do over here. So this is something that I can take up with you as well. Um, and we can discuss this uh, at another time. I'll be very happy to miss to help you on this. Okay. Okay, so I need to get in touch with you, clearly. <laughs> so please drop me an email and um, yeah, we can talk about this uh, offline as well because this would be a much more um, detailed session. But I think this is a, a very good, um, yes, perfect. So I think this is a good example um, to showcase how you can actually edit your profile as well because I think it's very important. Um, actually, if I knew you were on this call, I would make you like a co-presenter because you clearly have Orchid ID as well. So. If you want to present and you want to talk more about it as an example, feel free to let me know and I can make you a panelist at the moment. In the meantime, while I'm waiting for your reply, um, there's a request for He Kai Ming. So I need to go back to that. Give me one second. Sorry, is this the He Kaiming that you're referring to, who works in Menlo Park at Facebook with uh, 69 publications? So let me know, please. Um, Rotimi, is this a He Kaiming that you're looking for? So, okay, while I'm waiting for that, um, I assume that it would be, right? Because um, that's the one that's cited the most number of times with about 69 publications with a H index of 52. So let's take a look at the details for, uh, for her timing. Um, he or she, he was probably from uh, CUHK in Hong Kong. And then um, he was in Microsoft Research, went to Facebook Research. We can see in this case, um, the topmost topics that he has contributed for will be in terms of an object detection, action recognition, and sparse representation, right? In this case, it would be in terms of computer science, mathematics, and engineering in terms of data analysis. We can see that because of this area of research, he has a H index of 52, which is really, really high considering um, this area of specialization. So when I take a look at the latest research that's been published, it will be in terms of group normalization, 
uh, dense object detection and in terms of image segmentation in terms of rendering. And this is by the latest areas of research. When I take a look at the cited by highest, we can see that there's a very strong um, date. Wow. <laughs> yeah, there's a conference paper on deep residual learning for image recognition and a real-time object detection with region proposal networks and in terms of uh, human level performance on the image net uh, classification. All these works were all published quite recently in 2016, 2015, for instance, and they've been cited multiple, not multiple times. So actually what I want to go in, right, is to go into this actual conference paper itself, because with a citation of 41,000, we can see that there is actually a few weighted citation impact of 2227.43, which is really, really high. So it clearly is about deep neural networks and object detection. And we can see in this case, um, her Kaiming's area of research here is absolutely fantastic, right? Um, yeah, and it's been cited about 41,000 times, which shows that he's really a pioneer in this area of research. Then when I go into topics itself, we can see in this case, like, object detection, here's an FWCR of 3.93, right? For instance, with about 34 documents. So this is a good way for you to understand like how strong he is in this area of research. So yeah, let me know if this is what you're looking for um, with regards to what you're asking about um, Rotimi. So yeah, I think this is quite interesting and I think it's an area, interesting area of research that you've pointed out over here. Okay, so I need to, ah, someone's asking, is there a way to find the highest cited authors in a particular field of research? I don't think you can actually. Um, so it's a very good question. Probably what you can do, yes, maybe you can take a look at this. So if I were to, were to go to say a topic overview in this case, right, like object detection, and I go over here itself, I can see and browse for it, the top authors by topic top authors in this topic. So we can see that which one has the highest number of citation. This is a representative document for this topic. We can see the top authors in this topic, right? And now from here, you can actually see um, who are the best areas of researchers in this specific area. And this actually is very useful in terms of collaboration. So we can see that maybe in terms of top authors, we can see an Alan Yui. Yui. Then you can take a look at it. We can see it has a H index of 75, pretty impressive, with approximately about 420 documents. So I think this is actually quite useful as well. Uh, yes, someone is asking, can we edit the publication data and the author's name? Yes, I would say that you can edit the author's name based on the selection of the dropdown. So just now we, we saw under Professor Singh's example, he has multiple um, profile names that he can choose to adjust and change, you can do it that way as well. So yeah, let me know if that's what you're looking for. But in the meantime, I think this topic's example is actually very interesting. Um, you might be interested to explore this more so that you can find out who you may want to actually work with, right? That's something really powerful and useful. Someone's asking, can we track for predatory journals through Scopus? Um, if the journals are not index in Scopus, there's probably a main reason. Scopus doesn't index predatory journals. Um, or if you feel that there's a predatory journals in Scopus, write to us, write to me and let me know and we will escalate this accordingly. But there would not, there's a very, very, very low likelihood of predatory journals on Scopus. So yeah, I hope this answers your question. So someone is asking for Jonathan Aman. I think this question has been come out a couple of times. Let me take a look. No, it does seem to have an author name by Jonathan Aman. So you need to let me know if um, I may have misspelled it as well. Okay, so I think this actually has been very, I'm opening a can, of, well, I won't say open a can of worms, but I'm opening a very interesting topic on predatory journals. But let me get back to that in just a bit so that I can finish up this session here because I've just a bit more to go through with you on what I wanted to present. So I will get back to you as soon as I can. Okay, 
So going back to what we were talking about when we we're talking about authors, and I'm sorry I didn't manage to go through the whole list of authors you guys suggested, but there were some really interesting examples there. Um, how can you collaborate internationally and locally, right? So I spend a lot of time talking about topic pages, but this is really why I like it because topics are essentially documents with a common focus intellectual interest, and we cluster it based on a direct citation analysis, right? So such as object um, classification just now that we're talking about. Then now we can talk about topics and topics itself, you can find out more about topics that you may not have known previously, or you can want to explore in greater depth and detail. And this happens when you're identifying or talking about an author that you're familiar with. So. Topics is essentially a collection of documents um, that can be large or small, new or old, and they can be growing or declining in momentum. Um, and new topics will surface with time because they are dynamic and they will evolve, right? Um, so yeah, one thing that we also want to talk about is that use topics as an example to collaborate with. Um, then when you go into topics, you can do what I did. Then you can, bro you can go into the top most representative document or the most prominent research article in that area. And then you can go into the who's the most prominent author in that area, right? That's something that you can consider browsing about as well. I think it's cool. Um, we can find out who are the co-authors and we usually showcase only the top 150 co-authors here in this case. And then these are people that you can collaborate with as well. So just now what I did at the same time was to go down into the article itself. And this is what we call as article level metrics. I will be covering this in the next session, but um, suffice to say, when you're looking into an article, like what I did just now, when I went to that specific article in terms of um, research by her timing, I was able to see quite a number of information, right? The number of citations, the FWCI, right? I didn't go into the plum print. Um, that's something I would do the next time around. But this really showcase, uh, this is what we call as article level metrics or alt metrics. And we cover this uh, in terms of a usage captures, mentions, social media and citations view. We'll talk more about this next session. Yeah. So in this case, for instance, if there's a topic you're interested in, right, you can be very specific. You can search for say Islamic studies. Then you can go down into this in more detail. Then we can see that Institutions like UKM and UM are the ones who publish it the most, as well as RIUM and SOAS over in London. And then you can go into more detail when you click onto this, and then we can find out who are the top authors in this area as well, including a professor totally. Okay, the next part here, which I think Professor Singh has done, is to create an ORCID ID, right? So what is an ORCID ID? Okay, an ORCID ID basically creates a transparent connection between researchers, their contributions, and their affiliations by generating a unique identifier for you to use, right? Um, we have an ORCID ID, which is a unique persistent identifier free of charge for researchers. So in this case here, as an example, what we have here is kind of like a passport ID or a identification or your NRIC, right? Um, and an ORCID record that's connected to your ORCID ID. So this is what happens when you create an org ID, which I think is actually very useful. Um, why do we do it? It's because sometimes we have very similar names, right? So my name is Nicholas Park, N Park, right? And sometimes people might, might just, there'll be like multiple N Parks around. So which Nicholas Park is Nicholas Park, you know? Um, which J Smith is a Jonathan Smith or Jason Smith or John Smith. So this is something that you own and control. Um, and this is something that connects with your own professional information, like affiliations, grants, publications, peer review. So it's a very straightforward process. Register, get your own ORCID ID, use your ID, right, consistently so that you get credit for your contributions and you can share it around. And the more information that you put in your ID, uh, the more cleaner your data sets would be, right, for instance. So yeah, I think that's really what I really wanted to share case please use org ID. It really helps in terms of creating your profile and making it cleaner as well. So this will be useful. So if you like this topic, we actually have a whole range of workshops that we conducted in 2020. Um, this is some of the workshops that we conducted together with my colleague, uh, Sander, uh, as well as Derek as well. Um, if you want to know more updates about Scopus, we have a lot of information updated on the Scopus blog that you can go to to take a look at. And then we also have information on Library Connect, where you can find out more information about how librarians can teach about science literacy, 
how you can connect information for best practices. Then from a researcher standpoint, um, some of you have been asking about publishing in journals, right? One very good example that we do over at Elsevier is that we have an Elsevier journal finder. So this allows researchers to find journals that are best suited for publishing your scientific article. Um, by using a fingerprint engine or big data, we use smart search technology to match keywords to match your article to Elsevier journals only. So all you have to do is put in your paper title, your paper abstract, your keywords and your field of research, and then we'll map it accordingly to your research titles itself. So you can see accordingly to what journals you're looking for, you can sort the results by best match. And crucially now in the journals that you're looking at, you can see what is your site score value, you can see what is your impact factor, we can see the acceptance rate of the journal, which is 23%. Not the lowest, but it means that you get rejected 77% of the time. You can see the time to first decision is five weeks and the time to publication is three weeks. So you get all this level of information that you might not, that you tend to be curious about, but you're not 100% certain. Um, another thing that we do is actually we have what we call a researcher academy. This is a free to use program. Um, I like it a lot. I think it helps researchers a lot. So it showcases how you can prepare yourself in your career, how you can write better, how you can read better, how you can track better, how you can get funding for your research, how you can make sure that your articles are accepted in top journals. And this is a completely free service. And these are some examples, right? For funding, for RDM, for research collaborations, in terms of fundamentals for manuscript preparation, writing and book writing, when you're publishing, how you can find the right journal, what are ethics, what are open sciences, how you can do peer reviews, how you can be a peer reviewer, and how you can go through a peer review to address the questions that are being, height, um, being, being brought up. And then we can also see what are the social impact of the articles itself as well. Okay, so there was a whole list of questions and I feel that now is a good time for me to go through it. So let me check through it, okay. If the journal has predatory characteristics but not listed under predatory journal? Okay, I think this is a very good question and it's also very gray. So it really depends on what sort of predatory characteristics there are. If you feel that the journal has predatory characteristics um, and you're not certain, and if it's indexed in Scopus, let us know, we'll do an investigation. But you need to be very certain uh, about this before you sh we do it because we will have to investigate this very thoroughly. That's one step. The other thing is that, um, because predatory journals itself, the definition of it is so gray, you, you're not always 100% certain is the journal definitively predatory or is it not. But if you feel that the journal is self-interested and they don't really care so much about scholarship in terms of the quality, let us know because this is obviously a key point of concern. Someone's asking, how do you manipulate the point clouds? I'm assuming that it's under topics. Um, I can go through and that give you a demonstration uh, um, later to showcase how you can look through it again as well. Yes, okay. So glad that some of you are using Researcher Academy. Um, I can go back to answer, do some of the searches that you guys have highlighted as well, um, including Agulam Sawa Yusuf. So I'll go back to a live demo in a bit and Ken Highland. Ah, is there a way to find the highest cited authors in a particular field of research? This is actually not so straightforward, I would say. Uh, I would say what you can do, well, yes. Okay, so what you can do for this area, um, so anonymous attendee, that's a good question. What is the area of research that you have in mind? And I can give you a, give you a live demonstration of that. In the meantime, I have to go through the author that was suggested. Community of inquiry. That's a topic that I'm not aware of, but I will go through you. I'll go through it with you in just a second. So Amy, I'm running through this search for you right now. Let me know if this first name and last name was correct. Or is it the other way around? Okay, this is interesting. Okay, so we can see that Professor Yusuf here is from University of Malaya. Um, area, yeah, there we go. I guess 
the area of specialization is indeed in Wayang Kulit, and um, it covers as well um, topics in modern Iran, Iranian history, as well as ecofeminism, right? So in this case, let's take a look at the author history. Professor Yusuf was previously at USM and then um, currently, I think, over at University of Malaya as well. And um, the topmost citation articles, the highest citation was published in 2017 on Wayang Kulit in Kelantan, as well as graffiti art as well. And yeah, interestingly, uh, article on Piet Mondrian in on early neoplastic compositions and six principles of neoplasticism. This is actually pretty cool stuff, actually. I really like this. Then you can go and take a look at the topic pages. And then in this case, you can find out about how this is actually like as well. Yeah. And then in this case for Professor Yusuf, um, we can see these are three of the co-authors that they've worked on together. So yeah, I hope this helps. Someone's asking on, wait, I owe this community of inquiry. Okay, so now that if you want to look for the topmost um, topics itself, right, I think instead of authors, what you can do is to go to searching for documents here. And then what I'll do is I'll put as community of inquiry in brackets. And then now this is a search keyword here itself, right? So we can see what are the keywords here, but the other thing that we can do here is to do what we call a uh, analyze search results that you can see over here. Um, when you analyze the search results, you can find out who has published the most articles, for instance, et cetera. So let's take a look at this, this detail here. So the community of inquiry will be here, right? You can see the documents by who has written the most article in terms of community of inquiry. I usually like to do control tab open and then we can see accordingly as well. Sorry, my tabs are bad. <laughs> so in this case, um, Professor Garrison, right, has written a lot of articles here in this case. Um, Professor Garrison is from the University of Calgary um, in Canada, H index of 32, really, really high. 55 documents as well, right? Then you can see in this case, um, when you look at topics, let's take a look at say community of inquiry. I think there'll be quite a number of topics that he or she will have covered as well, right? So in this case, um, community of inquiry over here, social presence, you can see who are the top authors in this topic. And then um, you can see a representative author. We can see a professor Dragan is also really strong here as well in terms of community of inquiry. And then we can see H index of 41 from Munash University as well. So I think this might be something that you might be interested in as well, right? Community of inquiry, social presence, and uh, online discussion. So that's one way that you can consider searching for top authors. The other example that I like to do would be to take a look at who the top institutions are when they're publishing this area of work. So we see it by authors here. You can see the documents by affiliation. When I click on this, we can see that the University of Calgary has published about 39 um, articles on this. We can see Purdue in America publishing 17 documents in this as well. Then we take a look at by funding sponsor, which might be useful. You can see that there's different areas as well. Japan Society for Promotion of Science, the Ministry of Cult Education, Culture, Sports, Science and Technology, et cetera. So this might be something that you might be interested in, right? Um, it seems like the States is the one that they publish the most articles in, right? So where else in Malaysia, you have 30 documents, but let's take a look at Malaysia with 30 documents when you're browsing for this. We can see here in this case, what we have done is that there's a search for community of inquiry and it's limited to Malaysia, right? Then now you can filter accordingly. You can see um, who is the author that's written this the most, right? Or you can even browse by the top most cited article in terms of uh, community of inquiry. You can see when it comes to say interactive learning environments, there's uh, Professor Chang. Um, yeah, and I think this might be something that you might be interested in as well. So hopefully this answers your question. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Yes, uh, Yusuf, this, um, this lecture, well, I won't say this lecture, but more like this workshop itself um, is recorded. So you all get a copy of this recording after the session. Um, and then you can take a look at all these examples that I'm running through with you. At the end of the day, this is just one particular method of getting the data and the questions that you're looking for. But I would say this really depends on how you're doing your searches for as well. Yeah. So Amy, I guess, yes, you're right. Um, I guess it hasn't showed all of its research. Uh, what we have so far is that, that those were some examples 
of articles that were um, indexed on Scopus. So the other thing that I can say is that um, one example, let me take a look at this. I think what I could do is to showcase to you secondary documents. Yeah. So there would be what we call as secondary documents, which may not be included in it as well. So those documents are the ones that are not indexed on Scopus. So there are probably more articles that he has written about, that's, um, he has written about, but they might not be indexed in Scopus yet. So you might have to wait a little bit of time for that to happen. Um, then again, if you feel that um, there are articles that are missing from Scopus, let me know, and then we can choose to, we have to look, investigate into it because it depends on where he has published his articles in. Okay, great. Okay, I think, yeah. So it's approximately about 4.10 right now. We have, um, no, secondary articles are not review articles. Um, in this case, secondary articles are kind of like missing documents itself on Scopus. So if you were to search, if I'll go back to results. And then secondary documents, not secondary articles, right? So secondary documents are maybe include documents which were part of the references, which may not be indexed in it. So that's for your information as well, yeah. No worries. So, okay, it's approximately about 4.07 right now. I can take one last question in the chat box or the Q&A box. Um, sorry, what do you mean by institutes like Google, which are more active in fields like remote sensing and machine learning? Are you referring to the specific topics on remote sensing and machine learning? If you are, we can also do searches on that specific, specific area of topics as well. So if you were to do searches on this, remote sensing machine learning, well, let's do machine learning itself, right? And then you get a whole range of articles that you might be interested in. You can see that there's a lot of topics. Um, what you might want to do at this point when you're doing such like this, because machine learning is a very, um, it's a very engaged view at the moment. Maybe you may even want to limit this to 2021. Obviously, it's a key topic, trending topic. That's why there's about 14,000 articles in 2021 so far. Then the other thing that you can do is to, to sort it by the most highly cited articles. So we can see in this case, this article that's being written on... Um, Artificial intelligence on a multidisciplinary perspective on challenges, opportunities, and agenda for research. Uh, this has got garnered about 101 citations already. This is actually quite massive. And we can see in this case, this is a massive, um, probably a review paper. Uh, and we can see in this case that there's a lot of collaboration across multiple authors who have worked on this as well, right? So we can see that there's a professor, there's EMARC in Swansea University, there's a School of Management in the University of Bradford, et cetera. All these are basically like collaborative art articles. And we can see that with 101 citations, it's a few weighted citation impact of 214. Yeah. So yeah, this is actually a pretty interesting question. Thanks. Uh, Saidu, I think the International Journal of Innovation, Creativity and Change, this journal, is this Q2 in terms of Web of Science or is it Q2 in terms of Scopus? So uh, I'm not familiar with the journal, but what I can do is quickly run through a search for you by title. Let me see if it pops up. Journal, International Journal of Management. International Journal of Man Innovation, Creativity. So there we go. So this is about, it's ranked 212 in 294 under us and humanities. I'm assuming this is the journal that you're referring to. Um, let me take a look at the site score trend. This is arts humanities. If it's in terms of education, it's ranked 917 out of 1,254. So I won't say it's in, Q2, it seems like towards Q3, Q4 to be exact. 
So I don't think this is a Q2 journal, but it depends, once again, Saidu, um, which uh, platform you're using, if it's Web of Science or if it's Scopus. Yeah. Ah, okay. So someone, someone is asking, what is the meaning of site score? Is it impact factor? A good question. Site score is basically more or less an Elsevier slash Scopus metric that we developed based on Scopus data. So impact factor is developed for Web of Science. Site score is developed for based on Scopus data itself. So if you want to take a look at it, you can click on the I over here, and then we can find out more information about site score itself and how it's being calculated. Um, but what we do here actually is quite transparent. We can see in this case, site score is calculated based on the total number of citations from 2016 to 2019, divided by the total number of documents from 2016 to 2019. So that's something that you can take a look at. Yeah, I hope this answers your question. Okay, so um, with regards to the video recording, as well as the slides, I'll be sending this over to the library and they'll be sharing it over with you as well. So yeah, not at all. Okay, so we're probably about 12 minutes overdue, overran. So I'm really sorry for overrunning the session, but I think you have brought up some very interesting questions. Um, I would say stay tuned for the next series of the workshop itself. I think it's uh, quite interesting. It will be in May. Um, and I look forward to seeing you guys over there as well. And we can carry on asking me questions. And if you'd like me to give examples, I'll be very happy to run them through with you as well. So in the meantime, thank you so much. Um, Yes, Saidu, this journal is indexed on Scopus, so not to worry. Uh, yeah, in the meantime, I would say, please trouble you, can I trouble you to actually complete in the survey and you get a code in as well to fill in so that you can also get a certificate as well. So yeah, in the meantime, thank you so much. I look forward to seeing you in May. Have a good day ahead. I'll send over the recording and the slides shortly. Have a good day. Okay, I will copy. Here you go. Please find, sorry. Please find the survey and the code over here. You will copy it. I will stop sharing in a bit. Thank you, Andrew Carmel.